So we're thankful again for everybody tonight. Hope your week is going well. We want to continue on with our study of the Gospel of John. I will remind you again that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written for the express purpose of proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John, of course, approaches this differently from Matthew, Mark, and Luke because he basically calls witnesses to testify that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. And so we've approached it from that angle, realizing again there were no chapters and verses when this was originally written, as there were, uh, were no chapters and verses in any book of the Bible. But as we look at this, I want to drop back before we continue in chapter 19, John chapter 19. I want to drop back just a little bit to what we talked about last week because I want to emphasize a point, I hope, at least my intentions are, and that is to where Jesus would not answer Pilate in verse 9 of chapter 19. And Pilate uh, says to him, uh, Speakest not thou to me, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? <clears throat> I want to say this regarding authority or power. If you read the book of Mark, which is thought to be written to most of the Latin-speaking people, which would be basically the Romans, take note sometime in reading Mark and how much he focuses in on power. And I think you'll find uh, that that is purposeful because the Romans respected power. But be that as it may, Jesus had remained silent, and Pilate said this to him. Then Jesus responds, as we read last week, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. I want to talk a little bit about power. Now, Pilate was a corrupt individual as you run into in the Roman Empire. And uh, when you begin to look at the Roman Empire itself, we all know it was very corrupt. But it's just one among many, many corrupt empires and nations, even as we have this present hour, and I'm quite sure, until the end of time. But I want you to keep that in mind because when you realize Christ is saying, you have no authority except what authority is given to you. Remember, he says that to Pilate. Well, when you turn over to Paul's letter to the Romans, in Romans 13, he makes this comment. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Fundamentally, that's what Jesus is saying. Then, of course, if you look back over into the Old Testament, of course, it's been around a long time, when Jesus came to the earth, Daniel is in Babylonian captivity. And he has this to say to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 17 of Daniel 4. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. I'll only be reading a portion of, of the whole thing. You'll have to read the whole thing to get the context. But this stands alone. He says, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand uh, by the word of the holy one. Now, here's the point. Here's what he wants him to know. Remember who he's saying this to originally, to Nebuchadnezzar and the caliber person he was. To the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Now, with that in mind, Remember what Paul said, 
to the church at Rome in Romans 13 concerning civil government, civil authority. He says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there's no power but of God. The powers that are, that be, are ordained of God. Whosoever resisteth, resisteth therefore, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, I want you to take these passages and see the principles that are there and realize what's being said about God's involvement in every civil government that ever exists. Why did Hitler come to power? You mean God would oppose somebody like that? Well, he let Nebuchadnezzar come to power. Jesus said to Pilate, representative of the Roman Empire, thus a representative of Caesar, that you don't have any power except you're given that power. Now, who could give the Roman Empire the power the Romans had? Who could give Hitler the power that Hitler had? Who could give Stalin the power he had? Or the militaristic dictators of Japan in World War II? Or who gives civil power to the government of the United States? Well, if it's not saying God is behind all of this, just what would Jesus have to say to say it? Let's do it again. He says directly to Pilate, the governor, representative of the emperor in Rome, thou couldst have no power at all against me, Christ, except, now remember how you de describe the force of a clause of exception. If and only if it were given to thee from above. From where? From above. Thus we learn something about the authority and the concept of civil government and God ruling in the kingdoms of men and why such terrible people end up being in very authoritative positions. It serves the purpose of God. Who put Pharaoh, Pharaoh of bondage of the Jews, who put him into power? But if you go back and study about that, God says, I knew what he would do. And he fit the scheme of things, the unfolding, the scheme of redemption and bringing the Jews into who they are. This is the reason that we who are children of God, members of the church, of the body of Christ, citizens of God's kingdom, in the midst of a perverse generation, why it is that when we look at uh, governments, whatever kind of civil governments they are, good, mediocre, bad, terrible, to realize that God's involved, we just don't know what all's happening any more than those Jews did or Pilate did. But Jesus says you're able to do what you're doing because you've been allowed to have that kind of power. Now, we talked about a while back in the sermon about how we as human beings being wicked and have our own wills that we can thwart short-term desires of God. Ultimately and finally, God's will is going to be done. And you can love and obey him here and remain faithful to him and be blessed when it is. Or you can reject him and do as you please. And when his will is done, ultimately and finally, you'll be punished. That's the idea of the judgment. And that's what you see as the Bible pictures the judgment. People who love the Lord and kept his commandments all their life, they enter heaven. People who live for themselves, did as they pleased, gratified the desires of the flesh, no matter what God said, then they'll be in hell forever. Everybody living on this earth today is destined to one place or the other, and everybody that's ever lived 
is the same and everybody that will live. Point is, when we see governments going so badly, so terrible, we should still know that God has not been defeated. Not at all. I think we see that in these scriptures as well as others, but in these scriptures. And it will be good if we would keep those matters in mind as we're going through this. Jesus himself. Now, remember, he is the executor of the Father's will. There was not anything created. It was not created through Jesus Christ when he was the eternal word, coexistent with God, the second person of the Godhead. So he very well knew what all was going on. When Daniel uttered those words by inspiration, Holy Spirit, Nebuchadnezzar, Jesus was in heaven, knowing full well what was happening. And as the executor of the Father's will, he was involved in setting up Nebuchadnezzar and doing all those particular things that um, he says here that uh, would be done by such people as Pilate. So we need to understand that we need to be the godly people we ought to be in godly influence, that we ought to be thankful that we in America can exercise some influence in the government and that we ought to leave it up to God and pour it out in prayer to understand how these things are. But I want to take a little more time on that because it shows us God's involvement in these particular things. And we should not think because everything's fallen to pieces as it looks to us with our human sight. Doesn't necessarily mean it's so. Remember what Paul said, for we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. If we walk by faith and not by sight, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, then we walk as the word of God leads, guides, and directs. And now I refer you back to Daniel. Regardless of how things might have appeared to Daniel, he knew God was in complete control and never ceased to obey God faithfully. And all that was written aforetime for our learning, Christians learning, that we through patience and come for the scriptures might have hope. And so we see it reinforced here by uh, John's inspired record of Jesus' comment to Pilate, reminding him very well that the only power you have right now is because it's granted to you, you're permitted to do it. And in this life, wicked men are permitted to do a lot of things. But ultimately and finally, God is in control. I remind you again of Ken's teaching on Esther. I've referred to this several times concerning uh, providence. If you look at providence in the Old Testament, the book of Esther is as great an example of God's providence as is the account of Joseph and his preservation. Yet in Esther, there's not a mention of God and miracles or anything like that. It's just that God took care of his people. God had already told them he would take care of them if they would but obey him and be faithful. Now, Jesus has prayed as a human being, if it be possible, that this cup pass from me. Yet he knew that's what he had to do to save you and to save me. And so he would say "Shall I, to Peter, shall I not drink the cup my father's given me? This is the way it is. There's no other way. If man's going to be saved. I must do this. So Christians must adopt that same perspective and realize God is in control. Ultimately, finally, and eternally, God's will is to going to be done. Now, keeping those particular points in mind that I think need to be emphasized a great deal nowadays in view of the way so many things are being challenged when it comes to the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures and the authority in general, that we ought to realize that God's in control and that we need to be faithful to him no matter what anybody else does because that's the only way that there is to be saved and Jesus proves that and he's the only one could do what he could do to save us. Jesus hadn't done that who else could have. Nobody. 
And so we need to know as members of his spiritual body, the church, that we need to adopt the same disposition of heart and know that God knows what he is doing. He knows what he's doing and how this United States worked or how uh, United Kingdom works, or how China works, or how whatever works as a civil government, God is in control. Now that makes it even more so why, as in James 5, James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But righteous people are faithful members of the Lord's church, his children. Now you can avail much with God through effectual fervent prayers if you're a righteous person. Our concern is to be righteous. That is to do what God tells us to do in the way he tells us and for the reason that we might know we fully submitted to whatever command there is in the Bible for us to do to please God. So with those things said, let me drop on down here and um, uh, look at what happens then as we have approached the study of John, hoping again you're reading it word for word, and we'll try to hit the high points of the facts that are involved in this. Of course, the um, after he was crucified, and on the cross, uh, Pilate put up a sign above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And they didn't like that at all. That is, they, uh, the high priest and others, they wanted him to change it and say he said he was. Paul says, uh, uh, Pilate says, I, I've written what I've written. I think he was pretty well exasperated with the whole thing, being the character that he was, trying to find every way in the sun to let the man go and get out of it and pass the buck and all that. And you'll notice that um, when the Jews told him he wasn't any friend of Caesar's, if he allowed another king to, to live, that scared him. And the man must have been one of the most paranoid people on this earth, and he, many like him. And so he went about and said, go ahead and take him and you know, he washed his hands of the whole deal, so to speak. And that's what the saying comes from. And said, you take him and do with him as you please. So he tried to dodge out on that, but he did not want to ask Caesar call him into question. And I suggest you again read about what ended up happening to him. He was as corrupt as they come, and that's what got him in trouble eventually. Um, so we come down now and see that the soldiers after they crucified Christ. Now, we haven't mentioned much about crucifixion. I think most of us understand it. It's one of the most heinous, horrible, shameful, painful, drawn-out deaths that any person or people have ever dreamed up in their fermented evil minds to cause pain and anguish on somebody else. Um. When Jesus would end up carrying his cross, a lot of pictures depict him carrying the whole thing, the upright post as well as the cross post. Actually, what they did, they kept in, in places where they executed folks all the time, they kept the upright post um, standing up. I didn't mean they did it all the time, but where they executed folks, they did. And then what the prisoner who was condemned to death by crucifixion would have to do, he would have to carry the, the cross piece. And um, that's why it's called the cross. And Jesus already being scourged, as we talked about last week, was so weak he fell beneath the load of the cross and thus another carried it for him until they came to the place of his crucifixion. Uh, many times we'll mispronounce that and call it Golgotha. It's really Golgotha. And um, I might mention to you, if you back up a little further there on verse 13, that a place of the judgment was called the pavement, but in the Hebrew it's called Gabbatha. Uh, you can go to Jerusalem today and they have excavated down, or at least uh, to some extent, to where you can actually walk on the part of the pavement where they would bring people out to be judged by Pilate or whoever the Roman governor was at the time. So you can see that much. Most all of Jerusalem is uh, well uh, above the actual place that uh, people walked in the days of Christ. 
but that's there and you can see it. As you come on down here, you see then that they nailed him. These nails that they used, tended to use, um, I, I don't know how many of you ever seen a railroad spike. They they were shaped and looked a whole lot like like that, only they weren't that quite that big. Um, they're big enough because they had to go through the hand, and uh, most of them drove it through the back of the hand in a hollow spot that was what we would call the wrist. And it would then, of course, go all the way through. And they wanted it to, to go through so it would go all the way through the cross beam. And they could bend it on the other side so it would hold them to it because it would be very easy to uh, a person to tear loose from that cross. Now, if you go back and try to read what we know, what's come down to us about crucifixion, there were quite a bit that tells us the Romans uh, crucified all sorts of ways. Um, I think if I, my memory serves me correctly, and you might find this online, that there is, uh, they, they actually found the remains of a person who had been crucified. And uh, they have his arm, of course, it's his bone, and it's still attached to the cross piece. But what they did to that fellow is nail him from the hand all up his arm, several nails. So the Romans didn't have any particular way that they minded doing it. They just wanted to inflict all kinds of pain and anguish. And uh, the scriptures, of course, had to be fulfilled. Not a bone was broken in Christ. So that uh, nail went through that part of his hand the back of his hand, somewhere in that area, there's a hollow spot there. And uh, they did that because it would mean the hand would help serve to hold him on the cross. Well, you're driving through, if you drive that nail, you're driving through some of those painful parts of your body and nerves and so forth. Then when it came to the feet, a lot of times they, they would, they would uh, drive a nail sometimes through each foot, sort of through the ankle in the same way, at the hollow spot there. Then sometimes they crossed the feet and drove one nail through both of them. Well, these couldn't be little nails. And they had to be quite large. So he's got nails driven through his hands and his feet. None of these things would kill a person immediately. But remember his state of affairs. He's already so weak he couldn't even carry the cross piece, cross beam we might call it. And so they do that, and they nail his hands to that. Now you say, well, they haven't got his feet nailed to the cross. It's standing upright, if that was the way it was. Well, they would raise him up, hanging by his wrist. And there would be a mortise hole in that thing, and they'd drop it over the top of the piece that's standing up, the beam that's standing upright. Then they would pull those feet up. They would not let them stretch completely out. They didn't want that to happen. The reason why is, is that usually the people died on the cross through suffocation. Their pectoral muscles would end up being so paralyzed uh, from hanging by their arms that they couldn't uh, breathe so they would pull their legs up to a certain extent and then put the nails in and the desperation that comes when you can't get your breath you're about to suffocate they would stand the pain just to push up on that nail or nails through their feet and gasp for breath now you know why that they sent and broke the legs of the two thieves There'd be no way that they could push themselves up to breathe, and thus they would suffocate on the cross. And imagine, the, well, we can't imagine it, the pain of that. But now that was all done because there was a Sabbath day approaching, and the Jews didn't want those bodies left there. The thing about it is, is that when people died from crucifixion, many times they were there for days because they would uh, not have anything really inflicted to, uh, on them through the actual nails in their hands and feet. 
that would kill them. Of course, some, as I said last week, in the process of, of scourging, it was so bad. They would even die from that. So the Lord is going through one of the most terrible, heinous, painful things that ever anybody could go through, all the time knowing he didn't have to go through it, knowing that he's going through it, not for any sin he did, for he never was sin, never did sin, though tempted at every point like as we are. He's dying on behalf of each one of us and all the world. So when you think about that, then uh, you want to think about love. It's no wonder then that we have the simple but so in-depth memorial feast on the first day of the week in the assembly is a worship act in which we show forth his death till he come again. And our mind ought to be on these things as we protect the bread representing his body and drink the fruit of the vine representing his blood. Now, another thing that ought to be said about Christ is that when you read about him, his sense is never dull while he's on there. He's at himself completely. In every utterance the scripture records from him, it indicates a fully cognizant and rational person even to the point where he wills himself to die. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and he willed himself to die. So no man took his life from him. He laid it down. And thus to spend a little time on that, because our Lord's going through it as we read John right here. And if ever was that which showed forth the in-depth, fervent love of God for mankind, that does it. In fact, can you think of anything else that could demonstrate that kind of love other than what the Lord went through? Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid out his life for his friends. And he suffered all the way through. He wouldn't even take, when he cried out, I thirst, and they gave him a sponge filled with uh, vinegar that, I think, had myrrh in it, which was designed to dull the senses. He wouldn't take it. Now, they offered him vinegar later on, and he did, just enough to speak so he could lubricate his mouth and speak, it's finished, and Father, in thy hands I commit my spirit. And it was over. But he stayed on that cross six long hours. Now, I know everybody here has been, as we would say down here, sick as a dog. And when you're sick, it's, I think of an old terrible stomach virus or something that's got you miserable every split second you've got it and you can't rest. Well, the Lord was that way six hours, not even counting what on, went on up until this point, not counting the scourging, and the mockery, the slap face and spittle and the crown of thorns and all of that. But he went through all of that because of his love for us. You want to now go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You'll understand exactly better by seeing the commentary in the Lord's death, the process of dying that is given to us of what is meant in the words of 1 Corinthians 13. So as we go on with this, we see that the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and they divided them into four parts because um, it was four soldiers that uh, crucified him. And um, then they cast lots to decide whose the coat or the tunic would be because it was uh, uh, all one scene. They will tear it up so they could each have a part. And um, that shows you how little they thought about what the Lord was going through or the other two men dying there. They were more interested in dividing up what little he had so they could get their part, even to the point of casting lots to see who could get the tunic or the coat because it was one scene, made of one scene. But interesting, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. 18. They divided my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Now, when we look at the cross, while this is all going on, 
we see standing at the cross, and I think this is one of the highest compliments could ever be paid to the women of the world anywhere. The men had all backed off, and they weren't around. But at the cross are standing our Lord's mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. They were there. You know, over the years, especially when I was a younger preacher, I would hear some of the older preachers who at that time were my age or older. So we're talking about 50 years or more. And they would tell about going out in little country towns and holding meetings, starting the church. And I don't know how many of them talked about how that they would convert a woman who would bring her children, maybe convert another woman. And the church started off with women. As best I understand it, the church of spring started pretty much that same way. I don't know what there is, but uh, the women were not afraid here. I know that women are many times looked down on as frivolous and excitable and all that. Maybe compared to a man, they might be as a host of people. But these women were strong. And you think of Timothy, whose grandmother and mother raised him. Father's not mentioned. He was a Greek and established him in the faith through the learning of the scriptures to persevere. Women have that natural ability to continue on doing things in quietness and just never quit. They just keep on and on and on. And I think we can say that about these women, which I find it very interesting because we get to the resurrection, the first two to see him to discover his resurrection were women. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to that disciple, behold your mother. Now, that's an incidental comment. He's there to die for the human race and to make it possible for all men to be forgiven of their sins and go to heaven. But in the midst of all that, he performs a family duty. Obviously, his legal father, Joseph, is no longer around. And he's concerned about his mother. And he knows John. And so he can't say much because of the situation he's in. And also, the use of woman. You'll see this in a number of places in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That was not a, a term of derision. It was the way that they spoke. And he's not deriding his mother or making light of her when he says, woman, behold your son, talking about John. He simply is saying, he's the one who's going to take care of you. And then to John, you will take care of my mother. And I think that's a, a something that gets missed a lot of times here at the cross when the primary reason Christ is there, the singular reason he's there, is to die for humanity. And yet he takes care of family matters. I think we should realize that when we study what the New Testament teaches about the obligations of husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and children. It's pretty serious business when the Lord in the very process and the shame and agony, agony of doing the only thing he could do and anyone could do to save man, he still took care of the family matter. And it didn't handicap him, by the way, incidentally doing that from doing what he came to do and what he was doing. So from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home to take care of her. He made provision for her. Well, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, well, I'm, I thirst, I'm thirsty. You can imagine that would be. I referred to this a moment ago in talking about the crucifixion. And they took a sponge, they called it vinegar. We might call it more sour wine. They put it on a branch of hyssop and they put it up to his mouth. 
and he received the sour wine. And that's when he said, it is finished. Bowed his head. He gave up the spirit. So he willed himself to die. Now the Jews, so that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, requested of Pilate that their legs uh, might be broken and that they might be taken away. And we'll have to leave it there at that because we're about to run out of time. I hope these things have been helpful to everybody. And at this time, before we close out, as we close out the class, we'll have a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Our Holy Father, we're so thankful and humbled as we study from thy holy word about the death of our Lord on the cross. Help us to realize his love for us and thus the love we should have for thee and for him and for our brethren in Christ and the love for a lost and dying world that he had. And may we sacrifice our lives to the spreading of the gospel, the preaching of the truth, the living of righteous, godly lives. Help us to be mindful of the sick and the afflicted and the orphans and widows. We pray for our brother, Zach, that he'll get well. and Help us to always say, even as he would, not our will, but thine be done. Help us to know that thou dost hold all things in thy power and that we will know someday, if we will but be faithful, the blessed words of our Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So let us labor, so let us pray, and so let us work the works of him that sent us. Father, this day, for the night cometh, when no man shall work. For it's the name of the Master that we pray. Amen.